Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Dr. Beth Mollison. I'm a veterinary officer here with Clinicians Brief, and I am very excited to welcome you to today's webinar titled Gaining Confidence and Improving Efficiency in Everyday Dentistry. And before we get started, I do want to take a moment to help you familiarize yourself with the webinar platform so you can rearrange your console to your liking by expanding or shrinking the boxes on your screen. And if you do want to bring something back up that you've minimized, use the icons at the bottom of the screen. And if you're joining us live, you can ask questions at any time by typing them in the Q&A box on the bottom right side of the screen. And if you do run into any tech issues, you can alert us by typing them in that same Q&A box and we'll work with you to correct the issue. This webinar is approved for one hour of CE. So if you're joining us live after you've viewed the webinar for at least 50 minutes, you can access that CE certificate by clicking on the yellow icon in the toolbar or in the box in the bottom right corner of your console. And if you're viewing this presentation on demand, please reference the CE information box in the bottom right of the screen for instructions on how to go about getting that CE credit. And this event today is available with support from our sponsor, IM3. And joining us today and sharing her expertise is Dr. Jamie Burning. Dr. Burning is the owner of Veterinary Dentistry and Oral Surgery of Ohio and a consultant for multiple zoological institutions. Dr. Burning is passionate about all aspects of dentistry and particularly enjoys endodontics, oral surgery, comparative dentistry, and diagnostic imaging using cone beam CT. She enjoys teaching vets, students, technicians, and staff. We are so happy she is here. Thank you for coming. Dr. Burning, please take it away. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And also a huge thank you to everyone for watching this lecture um, and attending and prioritizing learning ways to do dentistry better. Um, we can always learn more so that we can do better, which is super exciting. So just a little bit about me to give you a quick background. I graduated from Ohio State in 2011, and I was a general practice veterinarian for a short period of time after graduation. If you knew me in veterinary school, then you would know that I had no intentions of going into small animal medicine. So the reason I share that information with you, I thought I was gonna be a pig vet. And I spent a lot of time learning to be a pig vet and not a lot of time learning to be a small animal vet. And when I got out into the real world and decided to switch over to small animal uh, medicine and small animal general practice, I found some really great mentors and started to learn everything that I needed to know. But <clears throat> there is nothing that is too basic about dentistry and all the questions that you kind of feel like maybe you should know, but you don't want to ask. Those are the kind of questions that we hope to answer. Those are the kind of questions that I like to help teach people. I wish that dentistry was taught to me a little bit differently. So that's the way that I like to teach dentistry. So. I was in general practice. I've kind of been there and seen what's out there in the real world. So I didn't just go from university to university. I have some practical experience to be able to help teach that too. So I did do my, my residency program in Southeast Michigan. And I did that as an alternate pathway resident where I also worked full time for a board certified veterinary dentist in Ann Arbor. Um, when I credentialed, meaning that I put together everything that I needed for my residency, I submitted that in 2018, which qualified me to take my board exam in 2019, which I was fortunate to be able to pass on my first try. While I was doing all of that, I had moved back to Columbus, Ohio and started a mobile dental practice. So I started that in 2017 and I traveled all over the state of Ohio doing oral surgery and dentistry procedures. I added a technician along with me in 2019, and I added her the same week that I found out that I passed boards. It was a pretty great week um, of my life, but she is now a VTS dentistry technician. She is my practice manager as well. Uh, in 2021, we opened in January a standalone practice, veterinary dentistry and oral surgery of Ohio. And I have currently five veterinary technicians. We are looking to add two more and then two uh, hospital administrator and practice coordinator up front. The reason that we wanted to have a standalone practice was one, to be able to do anesthesia for a lot of our high risk patients to the standard that we wanted to be able to do it. But then two, we wanted to be able to run our 3D imaging, which is our cone beam CT on every patient that we put under anesthesia. So we're able to do that. We did recently become 
a residency location, an approved AVDC residency location, and we are currently in the process of looking to hire a resident to add to our team. So if you or anybody that you know might be interested in that, please feel free to reach out to us. We are hoping to have somebody join by uh, summer of next year. We currently are building out a new clinic, which is very exciting. So lots of fun things happening. Um, that's a little bit about me. So let's talk about why we're here. I know that in general practice, dentistry is a huge part of every day of your life. So we're going into rooms and we're doing oral exams and we're identifying sometimes patients that have never had any kind of dental care, sometimes owners who have never heard of animals needing any kind of dental care. So we wanna go over some of the things that you're running into in practice that make dentistry feel really frustrating. Cause no veterinarian likes anything that they're not good at. and it takes a lot to be very intentionally good at dentistry because it's a whole lot of stuff that you have to learn in order to build on that foundation in order to be able to do it very comfortably and confidently and to be able to say to clients you know what i didn't know this before but i've learned this new stuff and i made this other recommendation previously but now i'm going to change that recommendation because i've learned some new things and so this is what we're going to do so learning how to do those things and working through the bigger hurdles so we want to kind of recognize and overcome some hurdles in the dentistry workflow understand the benefits of proper equipment and also maintaining that equipment hugely hugely important is maintaining that equipment Discussing a little bit of common pathology, we only have an hour, so I don't have time to teach you everything that I want you to know about dentistry. When I was putting this lecture together, I had to cut out some stuff that I want you to know about, but the good news is we have two more lectures coming up in this series. Um, so we'll cover some more stuff in those lectures in the future, but we'll get through some good common pathology today. And then also figuring out what kind of things make it so that we can make those decisions quickly and efficiently and start to build that confidence. Because one of the reasons that people send cases to me is for high risk anesthetic patients. The reason that I'm very efficient at doing those cases is because I can look at my diagnostics in front of me and make decisions very quickly on how I'm going to make a flap and what I'm going to do next and what teeth are going to come out in that quadrant. And so learning how to improve your decision making skills is going to definitely make dentistry a lot less frustrating. So a lot of things that we see include non-diagnostic radiographs, right? So if you look at that image on the left there, and that's a canine tooth, a maxillary canine tooth, and that's the view that you get. And you ask for another view and kind of everybody works together and struggles to take another one, but we can't get a better one and we can't get a better one. And we're trying to evaluate what's going on. That's really hard. So making sure that we have a staff that's trained in the ability to take those radiographs. You know, when we're looking at these radiographs, we wanna be able to say, do I need to move my sensor? Do I need to um, move my generator and make those decisions from there? We're the second lecture series in this series is gonna be on radiographs um, interpretation and some positioning tips too. So we'll go into that when we get to that lecture. But another thing that's a big hurdle is that we expect people to be doing dentistry when they don't necessarily have the skills or the knowledge to be doing that dentistry. So oftentimes it's that we have technicians who maybe know more than the veterinarians know about what's going on with dentistry and practice. I know certainly that was true when I was in general practice. I learned most of what I was doing in the very beginning from my technicians. And it was incredibly helpful to me that they had some experience, but it wasn't even necessarily that they had the opportunity to go to continuing education courses or have taken other ways of training. Um, so making sure that we you know, have that training for our staff. We also have this expectation of technicians, both monitoring anesthesia and doing dentistry at the same time. And the reality is, that's a really hard position to put people in. So we want to be careful that we're not asking somebody to both be doing anesthesia and dentistry. And we'll touch on that again in a little bit. But instrumentation, dull instruments are going to cause you a lot of problems. Having the proper instruments that fit your hands, that are right for you, and then making sure that they're maintained is going to be hugely important. This includes even making sure that your ultrasonic scalar tips are replaced regularly so that you're able to get the teeth clean appropriately. 
as well as you know our lux eaters, our elevators, all kinds of other instruments too. And then um, we wanna make sure that we have that comfortable to use, easy to use equipment. I, I can't tell you the number of clinics that I went to when I was doing in clinic trainings and mobile practice where a lot of the instruments are tossed into a cold sterile or you know maybe they're put in a drawer and those are not good ways to maintain our equipment. And a lot of times it's maybe we got stuff from a human dentist that had some leftover stuff. And don't get me wrong, I have plenty of that because my dad is also a retired human dentist. So I have boxes upon boxes of human dental equipment, but it's not all exactly what I wanna be using because it doesn't necessarily fit my hands or fit my use um, or fit my needs. So we wanna make sure that we have comfortable, easy to use equipment. And then the other thing is, Anesthesia goes on and on and on when we're there trying to make a decision on, you know, we have our radiograph or maybe we have to retake it or, and it keeps going and keeps going. And now we have a patient that might be getting cold and now we're at our max and now we have to get into a room. And so these are the kind of things that we want to try to improve our efficiency on. So when it comes to dental x-ray stuff, there are a lot of options that exist out there. IM3 has some fantastic options. They have both CR and DR technology. What that means is that they have the phosphor plate system that you can see there. And they have uh, CR7 and CR8. With that, their new CR8 is fantastic. And then they also have this new DR technology. And they actually have a size two sensor, which is the standard sensor that you would see normally, but then also this size four sensor. And this size four sensor is it's big. So when you're talking big dogs, instead of having to wait to get your images, you're able to actually get multiple teeth in that view. So it's a large sensor, um, one of a kind and fantastic. It's a new product that just came out recently. So we're super excited about that to be on the market. Um, the reality is when it comes to generators, some people have a handheld generator, some have wall mount, some have rolling stands. You have to find what works best for your practice. So it might be that you don't have room to put a wall mount unit. You don't have room for a rolling stand. Handheld generators are fantastic. There are some really easy to use handheld generators. And I, you know, get in touch with IM3 about those because those are fantastic. You just point it and shoot it. And the learning curve in the beginning is a little bit steep, but once you learn how to do it, it's fantastic. That's what we use at our practice. Um, so you just wanna figure out what works for you. And again, I did mention, but when it comes to taking those x-rays, making sure that we are aware of if we need to take another one, are we gonna adjust the sensor or are we gonna adjust the generator so that we can move forward with getting a diagnostic radiograph? So when we're looking at our x-rays, we wanna make sure that we are looking at these in a systematic approach. So the same with anything else in the body. If you're used to looking at thoracic rads or abdominal rads, you probably have a system in place that allows you to figure out when you're gonna be looking at the spine, when you're gonna be looking at which organs, and that system allows you to be able to not miss things when you're going through it. In the same way, we wanna do that when we're looking at our dental radiographs. So we want to take our radiograph with the apex visible, so the apex is the tip of the root of the tooth, and we wanna have three millimeters of periapical space. So that means the space around that apex of the tooth. We wanna make sure that we have bone height that we can easily identify because that's one of the things we're looking at for figuring out periodontal disease in our patients. And we want to make sure that we have the entire tooth visible. That tooth does not need to all be on one x-ray. So a lot of times we are training people and that's something that we hear is that, oh, I didn't know that I could take one root in one view and the other root in another view, as long as I have everything from that tooth, you can look at two images to get identification of what's going on with one tooth in the mouth, and that's okay. So you wanna make sure that you know which teeth are in your radiograph, <coughs> excuse me, and as long as, as long as you are never flipping and only ever rotating your radiographs, you're gonna be able to identify which teeth are in those radiographs. You're gonna look at your periodontal ligament space. You're gonna look at your bone height and density. You're gonna look at the apex and that region around that apex. And then you're gonna look at the roots and the root canals because that's gonna tell you, do we have a young dog? Do we have an old dog? Do we have a dead tooth that failed to have narrowing of that pulp chamber? Those kind of things. So, and we're gonna make sure that we evaluate the crowns as well. 
As far as other equipment and instrumentation goes, it is a really good idea to have a high-speed unit at your practice. So that dental unit would include a high-speed handpiece, a slow-speed handpiece, the ultrasonic scaler, an air water syringe, and then, depending on preference, could have suction as well. And then our hand instruments that we're going to consider are going to be scalers, curettes, periodontal probes, explorers, and mirrors. And we want to make sure that we have stuff like this available, because I certainly uh, know that it is an investment, but it's one that is absolutely worthwhile. And then when we have our surgical packs, that's going to include our blades and our handles, our luxators, elevators, periosteal elevators, needle holders, thumb forceps, extraction forceps, atraumatic lip retractors, which are a fantastic thing if you're not currently using, I highly recommend getting, and then root tip extractors for the occasions where we sometimes break roots. It happens to all of us. So scalpel handles, I just want to touch on this briefly because if you are not currently using a round handle, I strongly recommend getting one. There are a few things in veterinary dentistry that I find to be life-changing. A round handle is one of those things. So I would absolutely invest in a round handle. It does allow you to contour when you're making your incisions. It allows you to move that handle and contour to cut around the teeth and um, to easily and very precisely make incisions in the mouth. So round handle, absolutely necessary in my opinion. Um, I should also mention that veterinary dentists come with lots of opinions. So if you put 10 of us in a room, they'll usually get about 11 opinions. So those in this presentation are mine um, and mine alone. I trained with a lot of veterinary dentists and also some human dentists. So you'll hear kind of a little bit of everything. Luxators I have on here and luxators are designed to slice through the periodontal ligament. So these are a little bit different than elevators, which will be on the next slide, but the luxators are intended not necessarily to be pushed in a in and then turn motion. These are to slice that periodontal ligament. They should be kept sharp. And you'll see here in this picture, the purple ones, these are the extra small ones that IM3 makes and they're wonderful. So my hands are teeny tiny and maybe yours are too. Maybe they're not, but the great thing is when you find instruments that fit your hands and they fit into the palm of your hand and you can have that short stop grip where your um, index finger is right at the tip of that instrument and it should fit right into the palm of your hand and it's comfortable, that's the size instrument that you should be using. So if you have instruments that are coming down past your wrist and you're using this really big stuff and it feels kind of clumsy, you need to kind of reevaluate and maybe look into getting something that might fit your hand a little bit better. IM3 does have these from extra small all the way up to uh, large and extra large sizes. So look into what might fit your hand, what might be best for you. So absolutely worth looking into. We have those in all of our surgery packs. They're fa fantastic. Elevators, on the other hand, are going to have that wing tip on them. And these are going to be used for kind of sliding along that periodontal ligament space. Maybe you've made a little bit of a moat there or a trench, and you're going to kind of twist and turn or hold in order to release those periodontal lig ligament <clears throat> fibers. And so when you're using that, you can also use an elevator for what we call horizontal elevation, and that'll be covered in our extraction lecture. That'll be the third in this series. And we'll go into some, some different techniques for which we can use those. But elevators just have a little bit different use because you can put a little bit more force on those in different directions. And it really comes down to personal preference. So I love luxators. We do still have elevators in our building available to be used when I decide that I want to have those. There are some dentists that swear by elevators and elevators alone. So find what works for you. Just because it works for me does not mean that it works for you. So find what works for you and is comfortable and make sure that you're maintaining uh, these instruments so that they stay sharp. That's gonna be super important. Periosteal elevators. So this is that instrument that we oftentimes are using improperly in a shoving motion and slicing through our flaps on accident when we don't mean to. Uh, but this is what we are using to make our flaps, right? So our periosteal elevator is gonna kind of have a little bit of a spoon on it or um, a circle. And we want to use this in actually a modified pen grip where we have what's called a perch point and we're able to kind of push against the bone on top of the bone under the soft tissue and twist and turn in order to release our flaps. So we wanna make sure that we also keep these periosteal elevators sharp. And what we don't wanna do with periosteal elevators is use them to hold flaps out of the way because if and when you do that, and you accidentally hit it with your burr, which happens, I know, 
And we want to, if that does happen, we want to take that periosteal elevator and that then only becomes used for holding back flaps. So if we have destroyed the tip of that instrument, it no longer gets used for its actual purpose, which is to um, help in the creation of that flap, but it can get used for holding back flaps if it has um, run into a burr, as occasionally does happen in the real world. So then uh, we want to make sure we have needle holders in our packs too, right? So needle holders are going to be super important. I use tiny things when it comes to dentistry because I'm working in a small space. Like I already told you, my hands are small, but these mouths are small too sometimes, especially small dogs and cats. I use a small needle holders that also have the scissors on them. Again, personal preference. Some people have somebody sitting there cutting your sutures. Some people prefer to have a separate uh, scissors to cut those sutures. Whatever you prefer works fine. Thumb forceps, again, I use teeny tiny stuff. It causes less trauma to my flaps. So what we don't wanna do is use something that's gonna cause a lot of trauma to our flaps. We don't wanna squish those flaps a lot, a lot, a lot, or else it's gonna cause them to fall apart and we don't want them to fall apart. So uh, less handling of those flaps is better. And I find that it's easier to do that with smaller stuff. Extraction forceps, of course, they um, come in all different sizes and shapes and configurations, something that Many people don't know, because it's not widely taught in veterinary dentistry, in fact, I only know it from human dentistry, is that the curve on these should actually be placed in the same direction that you are trying to extract the tooth. So if your extraction forceps are curved like this and your tooth is here, you want to extract like this. So we don't want to place them opposite like this is what I often see people try to do. So we want to kind of place it and go in the same direction. So that's a really big concept in human dentistry. Um, hasn't translated as well to veterinary dentistry, but now you know. So now you can start doing that too. Root tip extraction forceps. These are great to have on hand. Why? Because we all occasionally break roots. And once we can gently elevate them out of the alveolus, we are able to then put these tiny little um, extraction forceps down in there, and then we can pull them up. So really, really helps with the frustration factor of getting those root tips out. Atraumatic lip retractors. This is something that if you don't currently use them, I highly recommend getting, particularly if you don't have somebody sitting next to you at all moments in time when you are doing dentistry. This is how I got through mobile practice. This is how I got through residency training. So this is um, something that allows you the ability to clip onto the lip and get the lip out of the way so that you have a surface where you can see the teeth and you can work without fighting that soft tissue. Definitely recommend having some of these in your practice. It doesn't cause trauma, obviously, atraumatic. It doesn't cause damage to the lips, so it's nice to have. High-speed hand pieces. I prefer this exact hand piece, and this is a swivel hand piece, and it is worth every penny of investment because what it does is take the pull off of your wrist. When you have a swivel hand piece in your hand and you twist to turn your high speed to use it in a different direction, what happens is that swivel piece actually turns so that that cord is not something that you're trying to move around with your wrist or your arm or your forearm or your shoulder, and you're not trying to pull the cord and pull the cord. So a swivel hand piece is, in my opinion, essential in practice if you are doing dentistry. I would highly recommend it. Um, and like I said, this is the exact one that we use and I love it, I swear by it. We have multiple, um, I, can't, I can't go without them. So definitely recommend, even when we go to the zoo, we were there this morning when I go to the zoo, I take this with me and I plug this into their machine there. So I really truly mean it when I say I can't live without this hand piece. It definitely allows me to save my wrist and be able to function. Ultrasonic scalers. Something that's super important that I just wanna mention is we want to make sure that we are only staying on teeth for five to seven seconds when we are using an ultrasonic scaler. There are lots of versions of ultrasonic scalers out there. This is a great option. Um, and we never want to use the tip of that against the tooth because you can actually cause loss of enamel when you use that on the tooth. And also, the reason we don't want to stay on a tooth for too long is because we can cause thermal damage to the teeth. So I've certainly seen cases, unfortunately, a veterinarian who brought um, their pet to us after their own staff had cleaned the teeth 
about a few weeks before that, and then the tooth ended up discolored or dead from that procedure. So definitely making sure that we're not staying on teeth too long, even if they have lots and lots and lots of calculus, we want to make sure that we are moving on to the next tooth and then coming back to get that. So just make sure that you guys are able to give that kind of guidance to team members um, that might be in that situation that might not know that information. Loops and saddle stools, I cannot express enough how much this will save your neck, your back, and your entire body being able to do dentistry. So magnification loops are, in my opinion, essential to be doing dentistry. So we, when we hire on new technicians, they go through about a six month training period. And in that period of time, they learn how to use their loops as well. So there are never any people working on mouths of patients in our practice unless they're wearing loops. So that includes technicians that are doing cleaning. Why? Because the amount of calculus that gets left behind when you can't see what's going on in the mouth is pretty significant. And so if you just have a big surgery light up above and then you don't have any magnification or light on your face and you're kind of leaning into the head so that you can see what's happening, your head ends up casting shadows into the mouth and those teeth that are already in the mouth cast shadows into the back of the mouth and it leads to a situation where we can't actually see everything happening. So the other part of it is you can see how upright I can sit when I do dentistry. One, because of my magnification loops so that I can sit up straight and two, because of my saddle stool. So ergonomically speaking, that is the, the neutral position that we want to maintain. So I will also say if you're currently standing to do dentistry, please don't. We don't want to be standing. We don't want to put our whole body weight into dentistry. That's how I was originally trained. That's what I used to do in general practice. I would finish a dental day and my forearms would be sore and my shoulders would be sore and my neck would be sore. And I had, you know, maybe taken out some canine teeth on a big dog or something. And it was my whole body working to get those teeth out. We don't have to actually do it that way. We can get these teeth out sitting comfortably and actually resting and being able to move your shoulder even throughout the entire extraction because you're just applying some forces with your hands. So we want to make sure that we, from a very, very basic standpoint, are sitting and working appropriately. So loops and saddle stools, absolutely get them. <coughs> Excuse me. As far as maintenance of equipment, we wanna make sure we are inspecting and organizing these instruments regularly. We wanna sharpen our hand instruments, replace the ultrasonic scalar tips when they are dull. Make sure that your clinic has a daily, weekly, monthly, and annual maintenance requirement for your dental unit. Figure out what kind of stuff you should be doing every day. Do you need to be oiling your hand piece? Do you need to be changing out something with the water? Do you need to be having the machine inspected? All those kind of things. Have a point person that's in charge of that at your hospital and make sure you know what that looks like. We wanna make sure we get rid of instruments when they become damaged. If those luxators and elevators become broken at the tip, they need to go. We don't get to keep those anymore. So those need to go. Um, I would recommend sterilizing your dental packs and not keeping things in cold, sterile or in drawers. So that's where our stuff gets damaged even more. Taking care of our equipment is a good way to like dentistry more because when we have really easy to use stuff, it makes it a lot easier to do dentistry. As far as sharpening goes, I'm not gonna touch on it a whole lot because you guys are gonna have a resource available to you to watch an IM3 video online where you can see some tips and tricks for sharpening. Sharpening can be really, really simple and easy. If you decide you don't wanna do it in your practice, that's okay. There are also sharpening companies that exist out there as well. So that's, that would be an option, but making sure that we are staying on top of sharpening. So why do we sharpen? Because we wanna make sure that we have that sharp cutting edge we want to preserve the original shape of those instruments because when we have sharp instruments, they're easier to use. Dull instruments require us to put more pressure behind them. And then as far as how often to do this, we want to check our instruments regularly. Maybe you have this go-to luxator that's a size three and you're using it on every single procedure. Well, it probably needs sharpened more frequently than some of your others. So just making sure that you kind of stay in touch with what that looks like how to staff for your dental procedures. I do wanna to touch on this because I feel strongly about this. Technicians cannot safely monitor anesthesia while they are also cleaning teeth or taking dental x-rays. 
When I talk to people about anesthesia, I tell them it's similar to driving a car. We usually get in a car and we get from point A to point B uneventfully. Occasionally we run into a detour or construction or traffic, whatever that might be. So that, you know, occasionally also with anesthesia, we run into something, maybe we have low blood pressure and we need to run a dopamine CRI, or maybe we have a low heart rate and we need to do something about that. So sometimes that kind of detour happens. Occasionally we get in a car and we get into an accident. Sometimes when those accidents happen, they're not fatal and we can recover from them. Occasionally, but rarely, the accident happens and the accident is fatal. So that happens more frequently when you're distracted when you're driving. The same is true with anesthesia. If you are asking somebody to be both monitoring your patient under anesthesia and also be doing dentistry, there is no way that they can do both of those things correctly. So keeping in mind what that looks like and making sure that we have those discussions and I know, I know the realities of staffing practices. I know the realities of costs and everything else that goes with it, but I still stand by the fact that we're doing the best thing we can for our patients when we have somebody separate monitoring those patients and somebody doing dentistry. Also, um, I do want to mention that we should not be just having technicians doing all of the dentistry in another room. And I certainly can touch on this because I did this when I was in general practice and it was not the best thing to have been doing where I was cutting a spay and in the other room, I had a tech doing a dental procedure and they said everything looked good and they woke up the patient and we were good to go. And I can tell you that a doctor should be in the mouth of every single patient when they are under anesthesia for a dental procedure. If you're currently not doing that at your practice, I would really challenge you to start doing that because it's the right thing to do. So get in the mouth and do the evaluation. And if you don't want to do the evaluation because your tech knows more than you when it comes to dentistry, get out there and learn more so that you can identify some of those things. Find ways that we can be doing that better because we always need to be doing our exam under anesthesia in the mouth. The other part of this that I do want to touch on briefly is that we should not be scheduling dental procedures and then appointments in the afternoon after it. Why? Because nothing is more frustrating and more challenging than dentistry that comes with a time limit. And that is where dentistry is in a lot of practices. And I know this because I've been there and I know how hard it is. And I know that there's nothing worse than being told you have 15 minutes until your appointment is here and you still have an upper fourth premolar to get out that would normally take you maybe 20 or 25 minutes. And so now you're going to start rushing through it and now you broke a root. And now it's going to take you 45 minutes to get it out instead. And now you have a frustrated staff and now you have frustrated clients and now you have a frustrated you. And so the way we avoid that is that if you want to do appointments on the same day that you're scheduling dental procedures, do your appointments in the morning, get your appointments out of the way and then step into dentistry. Dentistry is this unknown world where we find so much on our diagnostic imaging that that's where we're really figuring out what needs done with these patients. So making sure that we're scheduling dentistry appropriately is going to take away a huge amount of the frustration that comes with dental procedures. Let's cover some common oral pathology and we're not gonna be able to cover every single thing that happens out there, but we're gonna talk about some stuff that does happen in our patients. So fractured teeth are gonna be one of the most common things that you're gonna see out there in practice. This resource is available on the AVDC website, it's avdc.org. And this goes through the types of fractures. So we can have an uncomplicated crown fracture, which is where we don't have pulp exposure, but we have a fracture into the dentin. We can have a complicated crown fracture, which is where we do have pulp exposure. We can have, and, but it's just on the crown of the tooth. We can have an uncomplicated crown root fracture, which a lot of people are like, well, what am I supposed to do with those? If it's fractured up underneath the gum line and it is to the level of the mucogingival junction where that gum tissue and that mucosal tissue come together, those teeth need to come out because you can't save them from a periodontal standpoint. So that would be a reason to take those out. If it's just slightly fractured and you're still going to be able to maintain the periodontal health of that tooth, then they might be able to be um, monitored with time as long as there's no radiographic changes indicating any kind of periapical lucency or disease around that apex or tip of the root of the tooth. Complicated crown root fractures typically need to come out. The only exceptions that I make for these are usually with our working dogs or our zoo patients. And then root fractures, you're gonna detect those mostly just on your x-rays. So this would be some examples of some complicated crown fractures there on the top. You can see that we have a mandibular canine tooth that is fractured. And then on the bottom picture there, we have a maxillary canine tooth that is fractured. 
those were both great candidates for root canals, so we went ahead and saved those teeth. When it comes to these fractured teeth that do have pulp exposure, we have two options for treatment for these teeth. And those two options are root canal therapy or extraction. And those are the only two options we have for these teeth. Watching these teeth is not one of our recommendations. The reason for that, the reason this is not an option is because this is a great example of what happens when we watch it. A very well-intentioned veterinarian somewhere in their career had learned that it was okay to watch these teeth. They had recommended that to this dog owner this dog presented, and you can see on that root tip there that is black, and you can see it in the x-ray um, on that mesial root, that is totally necrotic, dead, absolutely diseased, very painful. When we watch these teeth, we watch them slowly abscess, and we watch our animal patients suffer with a lot of silent pain. So we wanna make sure that our two treatment options for these teeth are to extract them or recommend root canal therapy. So it's a fractured tooth in a cat, obviously a bad fracture in a cat. It happened when the cat was quite young, as you can see here. The apex or tip of the root of the tooth there is totally blown out and abscessed. Um, I say the term abscessed, I should say periapical pathology or periapical lucency in that area, but it's easier to communicate with our clients when we use terms that they might understand, like an inf infection inside of the tooth. So when we have infection inside of the tooth, we would consider that to, to be um, endodontic disease. Let me go back here, there we go. So then we get into these complicated crown fractures of deciduous teeth. There is a myth out there that exists that just because it is a baby tooth, we don't need to do anything about it. You can throw that myth out the window because that's not true. When we have a fractured baby tooth, what happens is that bacteria goes straight inside that tooth, goes to the developing tooth bud, and it blows up and destroys the developing tooth bud, can cause enamel, defects long-term for that patient. If you see a fractured baby tooth, it does need to come out. So when we're talking about these uncomplicated crown fractures, like I had mentioned, where it's not into the pulp, we de define that as not into the pulp and just into the dentin. But it's important to note that dentin is a living structure that does make up the majority of the mature tooth, but it's a permeable structure made up of a lot of little tubules. And so even a fracture into just our dentin can still lead to an abscessed tooth, which you can see here. So this was a fracture that was just into the dentin, but you can see that we have, um, let me draw here for you, on this root and this root, we have preapical lucencies. So this tooth was indeed infected. It did have endodontic disease. Talking about endodontic disease, this would be another example. We can see here this kind of lucency around our molar tooth. That's gonna be another indication of endodontic disease. Endodontic disease just means that it's disease in the pulp of the tooth, so inside of the tooth. So in human dentistry, if you go to an endodontist, they're gonna do root canals. That means they're treating the inside of the tooth, the pulp of the tooth. Versus periodontal disease. Periodontal disease is going to be when we have loss of the structures around the tooth. The structures around the teeth are the gum tissues, the periodontal ligament, the cementum, the alveolar bone. Those are gonna be the things that when we say this is periodontal disease, these are the structures that we are evaluating. So we have stages of periodontal disease that we break this down into. Stage one is gonna be when we just have gingivitis. Stage two is gonna be early perio and we have less than 25% of that bone gone. Stage three is gonna be those in between, the 25 to 50% of the bone gone. Stage four is gonna be, we have more than 50% of the bone gone that should be around the root of the tooth. Stage four teeth, they have to go. Stage three teeth, if that patient is going to be able to come back to you very regularly and the people are adamant on saving those teeth, those might be options for saving the teeth. Otherwise, those can go too, because those are oftentimes where people come to you with their pet. Maybe they've never been to you. Maybe they don't plan to come to you again. It's hard to say, but it kind of depends on the situation. So stage three is sometimes we save them, sometimes we don't. It just depends on the entire follow-up. If we have mobile teeth, if we have bone loss, if we have periodontal pockets, those are all things that are going to determine whether or not we're going to be extracting those teeth. So an important consideration is that cats also get periodontal disease, right? So we think about it in dogs very frequently, but cats also get periodontal disease. So what does that look like in our cat friends? This is periodontal disease that is caused by a malocclusion. 
The most common male occlusion that we see in our cat friends is going to be when we have paldoversion of our maxillary O8s. So that's gonna be this tooth right here. And that means that it is tilted in just a little bit and it is hitting this bone right down here and it is causing bone loss. So that bone loss looks like this. So we have bone loss that's just on that buckle or outside aspect of that tooth. And that's usually due to a malocclusion. So if you see a cat that has this kind of periodontal disease, that's probably what's going on. Cats can get other kinds of periodontal disease, just kind of generalized perio. They can absolutely have that happening, not necessarily related to any kind of malocclusion, but we can have bone loss associated um, with that in cats. So this would be periodontal disease in a dog. So this would be bone loss. And you can see right along here, this is what we would call vertical bone loss because we have bone loss right along the root. And then back here, we have what we would call horizontal bone loss. That bone loss is actually going in kind of the plane of the entire root, or it's gonna be between two teeth, and we're gonna have bone loss in that direction. We have bone loss here. This is gonna be our vertical bone loss. And then we have all of this is kind of our horizontal bone loss along there. So periodontal disease again. Periodontal disease is gonna be a huge big thing that you see in practice. This is going to be our bone loss along here, right? And so if we're looking at this and we're saying, okay, is this 50%? Yeah, it is 50%. This tooth has to go. So that's going to be our PD4 kind of tooth. So we're going to take that tooth out. You guys probably see teeth like this a lot. And the thing about teeth like this is that they're easy to take out. The tooth itself is easy to take out. The hard part is sometimes they break here where the little tiny root is still attached. And then the bigger part is that we have to make flaps to close these. If you're not currently in the habit of making flaps to close your extraction sites, I strongly recommend attending the extraction lecture in this series because we're gonna talk a lot about that. But we wanna make sure that we're making flaps and that takes a whole lot longer when we have all this granulation tissue that has already kind of folded in around these severe perio cases. Another reason we might be treating things out there, persistent deciduous teeth. If you have two teeth in the same place at the same time, by definition, you have persistent deciduous teeth. So what that means is that as soon as you see that adult tooth right next to that baby tooth, you should be recommending that you take out the baby tooth. If your patient happens to lose the teeth in the time that it takes from scheduling till when they're there for the surgery, so be it. When that doesn't happen, you're able to get in there and help to maintain the periodontal health of that tooth long-term. Because if you look at this here and this here, what we can see from that is that, whoop, is that we don't have healthy bone or healthy gum tissue that can live inside those two teeth. So if we have a baby tooth and an adult tooth right next to each other, in between those two teeth, we cannot have bone that is healthy going all the way around. That means our periodontal health of our adult tooth is compromised. We need to get those baby teeth out. It can happen in any breed. This is a Bernese mountain dog. So it truly can happen in any breed. It doesn't matter. They don't have to be small. Unerupted teeth. We want to make sure we're counting teeth in our patients every time. Why? Because dogs have four premolar teeth in the lower quadrant. They have four premolar teeth in every quadrant. But in their lower quadrant, they have those premolar teeth in front of that really big molar tooth. We want to count them because that first premolar tooth on the bottom, most commonly, is the one that is unerupted. When that is unerupted, it can lead to what's called a dentigerous cyst. You can see here that a dentigerous cyst is able to destroy all of the bone and the teeth in the surrounding area. When this happens, you have to go in and remove the entire cyst lining. So we wanna make sure we're counting those teeth. Why does this happen? When teeth are erupting, they have this embryologic structure that's over the crown of the tooth. When that tooth erupts, that structure goes away. When that tooth does not erupt, that structure grows and grows and grows and fills with fluid. So that is what leads to that destruction of bone in that region. The reason I feel so strongly about counting teeth and making sure that you see whether or not there are any unerupted teeth or missing teeth that might be in the mouth is because of this dog right here. I needed to see this only once in my career to make sure that I tell as many people as possible about counting teeth in the mouth because this is Titus. This is how Titus presented to me. And you can see here, this is not just an unerupted tooth, this is a tumor, but this is what that started as. And this started as an unerupted tooth that turned into a dentigerous cyst that turned into squamous cell carcinoma. So we excised this completely, but, and we checked the lymph nodes and everything at that time and everything was clear. But the reality of this situation, this is Titus immediately post-operatively, he did great for us for quite some time. 
he did end up eventually euthanized because of squamous cell carcinoma that could have been prevented most likely if anybody had ever counted his teeth. So it makes me really, really sad to know that this is what happened to him because nobody ever counted his teeth. So please, please, please count the four premolars on the bottom of your dog patients. Discolored and non-vital teeth. So these are teeth that there are some myths out there about these teeth as well. And a really important thing to know about discolored teeth is that when we have any kind of discolored teeth in the mouth, we need to do something about it. The only exception would be teeth that are chronically exposed to air. So maybe a significant class three malocclusion where just the cusp is brown from being chronically exposed to air. Otherwise, if you have shades of bruising, these teeth are dead and they need to either have root canal therapy or extraction. Those are the two options with dead teeth because we know that the pulp is dead. It's necrotic. And there is absolutely nowhere else in the body that we're like, meh, heh, necrotic tissue, let's keep an eye on it. No, we don't do that because that's absurd. So when we see this, we want to make sure that we are treating these teeth. Extraction, root canal therapy, those are your options. Stomatitis, feline chronic gingivostomatitis. This is something you guys are out there seeing regularly. A good distinction for you because we get a lot of these that are sent to us and oftentimes they're diagnosed properly, sometimes they're not and that's okay. As long as they're making it to us, we don't mind. But when we look at the mucogingival junction, that tells us, do we have periodontitis or do we have stomatitis? If we have something that is extending into our mucosal tissue over here, that is going to be stomatitis. If we have disease just of the periodontal tissue or that gum tissue around the tooth, that's gonna be more likely to be a periodontitis case. If we have it in the back of the mouth like this, that's kind of our standard that we would say it's FCGS with a caudal component. Anything abnormal, we wanna make sure we biopsy. That picture on the left, that's squame. That picture on the right, that's pyogenic granuloma. That's due to a malocclusion. So squamous cell carcinoma does happen in cats. It certainly is a, an unfavorable prognosis when that does happen. So if you see a cat with something going on in their mouth, we wanna make sure that we get in there and we take a biopsy because they have a poor prognosis. If it is indeed squame, you almost can never get in there and do surgery that's going to be curative because we need such big margins. However, it's not always cancer when it comes to growths in cats' mouths. You can have this thing called pyogenic granuloma, which is almost always due to malocclusion from the maxillary fourth premolar tooth hitting on the bottom. So it's almost always in the location of your mandibular O9s. You wanna check occlusion and you wanna biopsy these because it may be that we have a pyogenic granuloma and that is something that is able to be removed. And then we remove the maxillary tooth that's causing this uh, problem and we're good to go. So that's you know something that's fantastic and phenomenal to know about because we're able to not tell those owners that it's squam. Also, these rostromandibular lesions, about half the time they're squam and about half the time it's osteomyelitis. So it's important to know that just because we have something going on, like what you see here in the picture on the left and in the middle there, just because that we have that swelling in a cat, that does not mean that we necessarily have cancer. It could absolutely be something that's benign. And then look at that picture on the right. That cat, that is actually a proliferative variation of stomatitis. So this cat has stomatitis. This cat went on to do so well. After we took out those teeth, this cat's inflammation in the back of the throat all but resolved. We actually saw this cat back again this week um, to do kind of our final recheck. And this cat's doing great in this world. So he did need some additional medical management, but as far as all that proliferative tissue goes, it resolved when we took out the teeth. Now, you better believe I got in there the first day and I said, uh, we're gonna biopsy this before we move forward because I need to confirm that they are at, this is actually a stomatitis case. And it was. So just know that just because you see stuff going on in cats' mouths, it's not an automatic death sentence for these cats. Gingival hyperplasia, focal fibrous um, hyperplasia here, I just wanna to touch on because in your medical records, when you see these kind of cases, we should be writing gingival enlargement or we wanna write oral mass. We don't wanna use the term epulis. The term epulis is pretty outdated and not really accurate. It just means growth on the gum. It's a pretty worthless term as far as things in the mouth. And I know it's a very commonly used term still, but we wanna to try to get rid of it. There are a whole bunch of us dentists out there trying to get rid of that term. Um, and then the other reality is that gingival hyperplasia is actually a histopathologic diagnosis. So gingival enlargement is how we want to write that in our medical records. 
So that was a whole bunch of information for you. Some big takeaways is that we want to make sure that we are using appropriate equipment, appropriate instruments, and you know we wanna use our staff appropriately too. And that will make dentistry more enjoyable for everyone. And then the other part of this is we need to continue to build strong foundational knowledge base for veterinarians and technicians. That's how we're gonna get through this. That's how we're gonna start to like dentistry. I get it, veterinarians do not like things that they don't know a lot about and they don't like things that they're not good at. So I wanna help you to learn how to do better, how to know more about this stuff um, in all the ways that we possibly can do that. So making sure that we're open to gaining that new knowledge and you know, being here is, is a first step in getting that information. So a huge thank you to Clinician's Brief, um, Vet Medics, um, I am three all of the clients and referring veterinarians out there who trust us with the care of their pets and patients. And then of course, all of you for attending this lecture, we absolutely appreciate you. Awesome, thank you so much for that great presentation, Dr. Burning. Um, we do wanna go ahead and open it up for questions now. We have gotten a lot of great questions coming through. So if there are any remaining, please go ahead and submit those. Um, just a quick reminder that we just passed the 50 minute mark. So don't forget to download that CE certificate from the yellow icon. Um, two other housekeeping messages. Uh, one is a big one, and that is that IM3 will actually be offering a 10% discount on all IM3 equipment for those that attended today. So when online or calling in, you just need to enter the code dentistry. There should be a spot to enter that discount code and this should be active by tomorrow morning. Um, the other information I wanted to pass along is that everyone should be able to see a green reference tab. Um, Dr. Burning has put a video, link to a video in there that she would like to direct all of you to. Um, so first question for you, Dr. Burning. Um, this person says they do a lot of dental work they see a lot of small dogs and they're repeatedly getting asked by these pet owners, why do my small dogs have such bad mouths, need so many extractions? She said she usually responds by saying it's genetics. Do you have any good information to add yes. to that explanation for these this pet owners? This is a great question. I love this question. <laughs> so the reason for this, and they've actually done studies to show, is that the surface area to body weight the ratio of that in these small dogs is why they have severe periodontal disease. So the surface area of their teeth compared to larger dogs is significant. So because of that ratio, and when we shrunk dogs to be, you know, from out in the wild, having legs this big to legs this big, we shrunk teeth from being this big to teeth being this big, right? We didn't shrink our teeth proportionally. So the reality of that is because the surface area um, of those teeth allows for lots of bacteria to build up on them. Lots of bacteria takes away the bone, takes away the gum tissue, leads to all this disease. So there's your answer. I had no idea, thank you. <laughs> Good, good to know. Um, next question is, how do you know when your scalar tip is dull? Oh, that's a good question too. So typically um, the maker of your particular scalar, whichever one you have, will give you a guide. And when you originally get your tip, it'll be more pointed. And with time, it will start to get dull or kind of worn away. So you can compare where your tip is right now to where it was on that guide or compare it back to when it was new. And you can see from there, but absolutely reach out to the manufacturer of your particular tip in order to get that guide if you don't currently have one in your practice. Okay, great. Um, next question, well, I should say, we got a lot of questions about loops. I think you, you sure. touched on something for people wanting to know more about um, that life-changing piece of equipment. Do you have any advice on how to go about investigating loops, how to train yourself to use them, or any advice you can offer on that topic? Yeah, definitely. So it depends on kind of where you are in practice as far as if you're ready to invest in a pair that's fit just to you. They're going to be mounted to your eyes. They're going to need to be measured specifically to your eyes, to your working distance and all of that. Um, and there are companies that absolutely will do that for you. Or what I recommend for a lot of clinics that are getting started that just want to have at least a pair of loops for everybody to be able to use, they make adjustable ones. So they're not as customized, obviously, but it's a good place to start. Make sure that you get one that has a light source and then they make those that are adjustable. As far as getting used to working with your loops, what we do with our team is that we have them start with Play-Doh or putting together Legos, small Lego pieces, stuff like that, where they're figuring out what their working length looks like, how far in front of them they have to hold something, what that looks like as far as not leaning over, you know, sitting up straight, 
and using their hands in a magnifying way that they're maybe not used to. When I first started, the other thing to keep in mind is that your, your lenses are down here and you can still look out the glasses up here. So you don't have to like try to look through everything like, whoa. So that will make you dizzy for sure. So if you're prone to motion sickness, keep in mind that all you have to do is just raise your eyes up and then you can just still see out just the glasses part. Okay, great. Um, we also had a few questions coming in, of course, about radiographs and the frustrations sure. around, um, of course, getting good images. Do you have any resources or tips as far as educating not only yourself as a veterinarian, but also team education that you could point people to? Yeah, definitely. Um, so there are some training resources that exist out there. This is something that we end up training people on a lot at our clinic. We offer, you know, in clinic CE, a lot of veterinary dentists will offer it in clinic CE. There are a lot of VTS dentistry technicians that offer in clinic CE. My VTS dentistry tech and I are currently in the process of um, creating online dentistry CE content. So we will be launching that early next year. Uh, it's called Toothwise CE. And so that will be for um, veterinarians and technicians to be able to learn. And there's going to be a lot on there about dental x-ray positioning because it is one of the things that it's really hard to just watch somebody do or kind of learn, how do you learn how to do this? And, you know, we've, we've kind of taught hundreds of people how to do that enough times, but really getting in touch with maybe a local veterinary dentist and finding out, do they offer any kind of training for team members on that kind of thing? You know, if you're local to our area, you can, you're welcome to come to our courses. I mean, you can fly in for them too, but you're welcome to come to those. We get really, really positive feedback on um, training because we make it the whole goal that when you have an image up on the screen and it's not diagnostic, what do you need to do to change it? And that's, that's really what we need to learn to do. Okay, fantastic. Um, we had a question come in. I know you mentioned the most common malocclusion or one of the most common malocclusions in cats is that OA occlusion. How do you address that? Are you extracting just that tooth or um, what are your what's your advice there? Yeah, that's a great question. So because oftentimes when we have that malocclusion, it can cause that bone loss that can lead to that pyogenic granuloma, which I showed in those later slides. Um, in your practice, what I would do is take out that nine on the bottom and then you can take out that eight on the top. So certainly in our practice, we do it a little bit differently where we're able to smooth out that tooth on the top and then seal it. But if you're smoothing out a tooth and exposing any kind of dentin, you need to seal that tooth. So unless you're familiar with all of the bonding agents that exist out in the world, um, I would recommend just extracting that eight if you're extracting that nine on the bottom. Okay, great. Um, do you have any advice in talking with pet owners one, just about dentistry in general. I feel like there tends to be a gap with pet owners maybe not understanding that their pet could be experiencing pain that they're not seeing. Are you showing pet owners pictures of the radiographs when they pick up? Do you have any advice to our audience um, as far as that communication? Yeah, definitely. So this is another one that you know we see all the time. So one of my most favorite analogies to use when I'm talking to clients about this is because they say, well, they don't act like they're in pain. I don't, I think they're fine. They're still eating. And I'll say to people, have you ever experienced neck or back or hip or knee pain? And almost everybody, especially if they're over the age of 25 can, or 30 can say <laughs> yes to that, right? So most clients are going to say yes to that. And so when they say yes to that, I ask them, when you got up in the morning on the days where you had that pain, and you went through your day, did every single person that you interacted with in that day know that you were in excruciating pain from the beginning of your day to the end of your day? Or was it just something that you dealt with because you needed to get a whole bunch of things done in your day and instinctually you just figured it out? And they're like, oh, okay. So, <laughs> you know, that's, that's the reality is that it's this silent, silent pain that they just deal with. Maybe they're chewing their meals a little bit slower just on one side, and maybe they're taking one and a half minutes longer to eat than they were previously. Um, you know, so I think that that kind of conversation with people, helping them to realize that there are times that they're in pain too, that not everybody knows about really helps to put it in perspective. I like that. Um, next question is, what is your opinion on the vet tone? Oh, I love the vet tome. Um, you, you could ask my team. This is probably one of the most life-changing pieces of equipment that we have in our practice. Um, I can take out mandibular canine teeth in really big dogs in 
five minutes with the vet tone. Now it does take me an additional like five to six minutes to make the flap and close everything. So it's not that you're getting away from making flaps. Vet tone does not equal that you no longer have to do surgery. You still have to do the flaps. You still have to release the tension. So still do that. But the vet tome is, um, it's, it's an amazing piece of equipment. I bought it and it um, sat without being used for too long because I honest, honestly was just a little bit intimidated by it. And then as soon as I got the courage to start using it, I started using it all the time. Uh, we get it out every single week, sometimes every single day. I take it with me to every zoo case, uh, but I use it. I use it a lot. I use it all the time. I believe you. You sound, you sound passionate, Dr. Bernie. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more question. And that was the one that came up a few times. And I think it's because it's maybe a piece of equipment that not everybody has. But will you talk about suction a little bit and how that helps you with your dentistry? Sure. And that really just comes down to preference, honestly. Um, we do have suction on one of our machines. We don't have it on one of our other machines. Those are the two most common machines that we use. And I don't use it with every extraction case. There are dentists that do. So there are dentists that have somebody sitting there to suction the entire way, more similarly to what you would see in human dentistry. It's not how I was trained, so it's not what I'm used to. It's not what I do all the time. It's absolutely helpful in those situations. Let's say that you have a root tip that you're trying to go after and you really can't see because your field of view is blurred by the blood that has kind of flooded in it is very helpful to use a suction you just want to make sure that you have small tips because if you have <coughs> excuse me only a very large tip for your suction and you're kind of holding it over top of a very small root tip it's not going to help you as much as you would probably like it to so it's just personal preference okay great so much good advice dr burning um before we say goodbye, a few reminders to our audience. One, you can go ahead and download that CE certificate now. And actually, if you can't don't download it now, for whatever reason, you can enter this platform at any point, come back and, and download it at that time. Um, I did want to also mention, because there were a lot of questions that rolled in, Dr. Burning, people want to see the next two webinars in this series. Um, those will be coming soon. The dates are not set yet, but anyone that's interested can follow along with the clinician's brief um, CE newsletter or follow along on our website, and those dates will be announced, I believe, in the new year. Um, so happy to have everyone back for those next two sessions. I know they will be great. Um, another huge shout out to IM3 for making this presentation today possible. We really appreciate it. Um, to our audience, thank you for being here, Dr. Burning. Thank you so much, and we will see everybody next time. Thank you. Take care.